any folks that have to leave a little great thank you anyone who has to leave a little early you can always come back to it um but that's great thank you amy uh we're particularly interested in how to try to adapt these you know what, what can be rather complex concepts for younger grades um so it'll be great to get your your feedback on that and um because my students are um advanced gifted and talented so mm -hmm. it, they are a nice intersection yeah cool that's great to know thank you um and then galen do you want to introduce yourself okay sorry i'm galen moore i'm the project evaluator i see a lot of teachers i've met before and i'm so glad you guys are online and you know my requirement is please do the survey at the end of this session. I'm just a one note person, but we really appreciate it, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you, Galen, and good reminder. Um, then we have Jen. Hi, um, um, my name is Jen Friedberg. I am the science department chairperson at the high school that I teach at, Monsignor Farrell on Staten Island. And um, I teach AP biology and marine biology uh, in addition to anatomy and a freshman biology class. So I figured the AP bio and the marine bio would definitely be able to use this. Um, we've done a water quality study. Uh, we have a club, it's 104 students right now in the marine biology club. So we have kids that go out volunteering to collect water samples. And I said, let's add another layer to it and let's see what DNA, you know, so I figured, let me go for the training and then I can relay that to them so that we can do something with that next, you know, for the next season. Yeah, that's terrific. And do you do you have any? Um, do you work at all with uh, CSI? Uh, no, I actually teach at Wagner College as well. Oh, nice. Okay. So great, yeah, not great, not great. CSI. I went to but CSI for my master's degree, but oh, nice. um, I ended up teaching at Wagner. It was closer to my house, and the parking is a little better. Cool. Great. Wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And Katie is next. Um, Liz, I think we crossed paths uh, eight years ago with uh, Chris Mason and that project. Oh, yes, sure. Great to see you again. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. um, so I am at NYU. Uh, prior to NYU, I did a postdoc at Stony Brook, but I've been at NYU since 2012, I think. Um, I'm a member of the teaching faculty, so I teach um, ecology, ecological fields methods, biostatistics, intro bio class that now is 600 something people. Um, and so I'm, I do all these ecology classes. I teach a lot of um, ecology track bio students, but I also have a lot of environmental studies students who have never taken a lab course before. So I think that this would be a great way to expose them to some of these methods. So that's why and I don't do this stuff, so I'd love to learn to learn from you. So thank you for having me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So great to see you again. And it's, yeah, I'm very excited. There's such a kind of a widespread of um, educational levels here, because um, that is definitely one of our our uh, interesting challenges is how to how to make it, you know, these lesson plans adaptable for everybody. Um, and I'm going to ask if you are not speaking, if you don't mind muting yourself, that would be great. Um, okay, and then Kenneth, great that you were able to join. Do you mind just introducing yourself real quick? Uh, hello there, my name is Kenneth Tran. I am a uh, fourth year student at CSUMB. I'm an education focus, uh, marine science major. And I am working with, I'm currently working with Professor Alter trying to come up with lessons on eDNA that are more understandable and reachable by students who are looking to be in the middle school, maybe late elementary or early high school range. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, Kenneth and one other student are interning uh, in my lab and getting to know both the kind of the lab side of things and then also um, being incredibly helpful with developing some of these curricula. Um, wonderful. So next we have uh, Liz, other Liz. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liz. I teach at Incarnation um, School up in Washington Heights, a poorly resourced, scrappy little Catholic school. Um, me and my friends, and we brought India on, have um, a group on City Island, and we have some, you know, ORSs that we really haven't utilized, but the school does officially have one, and I'm just trying to kind of get the energy back. It's kind of why we brought in India with her science background to kind of help us get a little more um, organized on the science level besides just hanging oysters. Um, so I, the school is kind of interesting because I made a little movie. I'm so excited and 
the science teacher just doesn't seem so excited about it, but I'm not going to give up. So that's why I'm here and just to kind of continue my education about it also. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Liz. Great to have you. And then I think last we have Mike. Hello, uh, I'm Mike. I teach a uh, sixth and seventh grade at dual language middle school on the Upper West Side. Uh, I'm a new teacher. Uh, I just finished my PhD in fish genetics, actually, but I didn't do a lot of eDNA work, uh, more molecular stuff. And I wanted to find a good way to bring something cool sort of with my background into the classroom. Um, and that's been, you know, somewhat successful, but I'm trying to look for new resources and um, Billy and Oyster Project has a lot of really great resources. I did the um, GIS uh, training recently, and I'm going to try and get more involved in that with my class. And then this seems like a really great resource. So just trying to bring some cool stuff to my classroom. Awesome. And, and say again, what grades you were teaching? Uh, sixth and seventh grade. Sixth and seventh. Perfect. Okay. Uh, awesome. I think we've got the full yeah, I have one question. Um, obviously, this is being recorded right now. Uh, is the whole is the presentation going to be available as well? Or sure. Yes, I can definitely uh, make that available so Cynthia can uh, send out that link. Mm -hmm. Yep. That yeah. Awesome. Send that right after. Great. <laughs> okay. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to go back to my screen now. All right. All right, so we are going to kick this off with um, an introduction to environmental DNA, um, assuming that you're kind of starting from, from scratch, although it sounds like we've got a lot of um, good expertise in the room. So if I forget anything or you want to ask a question or any of that, just um, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll get to it. So we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of this method. Um, this, is, this is me from a couple of years back on an eDNA sampling trip in a, in a Florida mangrove. And you'll see one of the one of the big strengths of eDNA is that we're able to survey places that would be real hard to survey by other kind of traditional means of um, of assaying biodiversity. All right, so what is environmental DNA? Sorry, Awkward. my phone has never rang in my office before, so this is a mystery. <laughs> um, Okay, so I think I managed to silence it. Uh, so what is eDNA? Um, basically, we're all leaving eDNA behind all the time. Um, humans are, any organism does, right? And that DNA can come from cells that we're just sort of sloughing off. Uh, it can come from injuries for wild animals. It can come from um, animals that have died and are decomposing. It can come from digestive tissue, so poop. Uh, or gametes, so for, for animals that spawn into the, the water column, for example, or pollen, uh, that is gametes that are sort of free-floating DNA uh, in the environment. And for aquatic organisms, um, all that DNA that's getting sloughed off or you know, however it is, is uh, left behind in the environment in the water. And so we're able to collect um, environmental samples. In other words, not tissue samples, but environmental samples. So typically um, that means water or sometimes sediment, soil, to um, determine what animals have been there uh, recently and what, what animals have left their DNA, or I shouldn't say just animals. Um, it can be any, any living organism right, has left its DNA behind. Uh, the reason that we need eDNA as part of our kind of our quiver of uh, methods to assay biodiversity um, is because you know obviously we're in a biodiversity uh, crisis, right? We're, we're losing species at an alarming rate, and uh, in particular in aquatic ecosystems, um, biodiversity is actually very poorly known for the majority of ecosystems. Um, even surprisingly for a, a kind of a, what we could think of as a relatively well trampled <laughs> uh, area like New York, um, we have relatively little sampling that's happening in our, uh, in our waterways. So um, we need that information to be able to restore and, and appropriately and effectively plan conservation measures for these um, ecosystems, many of which are, are very hard hit by a variety of human activities. Um, 
but it's, you know, the typical surveys are expensive as we'll see and have other issues that come along with them. Um, in particular, because many of these ecosystems are changing so rapidly. So they, they change, uh, they often change rapidly in sort of natural cycles, but with the addition of um, forcing factors like climate change, they're, they're, they're uh, shifting even more rapidly than before. And that makes rapid surveys all the more important. So um, traditional surveys that we use, for example, for fishes include um, electroshocking um, or a variety of netting techniques. Um, these survey methods are obviously pretty labor intensive, right? You need a team of people to be carrying them out. Um, they also have a, a variety of other issues associated with them that are not always thought about. So a lot of them cause some mortality. Um, they cause stress for the animals that are being caught. Uh, you're catching typically both target and non-target species. Um, you could miss cryptic taxa, in other words, those that are um, rock dwelling. And um, you might have difficulty in actually getting to those spots like you saw with um, trying to access mangroves, right? Um, in addition, many taxa are very uh, tiny, so they're cryptic in a different way. It's not just that they're hiding, but they're actually very difficult to sample and then dif difficult to identify once you have sampled them. Um, sometimes they have very different life stages that make um, IDing them very tricky. And uh, we, you know, we typically have to rely on taxonomists. And sadly, there are fewer and fewer of those around. All right, so where does that bring us with the eDNA? So before we get into kind of the details of how we do these analyses, uh, I just wanted to kind of present this um, overview of the two different major methods that you'll hear people talk about when it comes to eDNA. So in either case, we're starting with um, DNA that we extract from the environment. So from, let's say from a water sample. And then we can go one of two routes. So um, we can go the meta barcoding route. So that's on the left. And metabarcoding is going to return to you a, uh, a huge number of DNA sequences from that sample that um, reflect whatever kind of taxonomic specificity you have chosen with your sequencing primers. We'll talk a little bit more about sequencing primers. Um, so you're getting potentially you know, a, a list of um, all the vertebrate DNA that's in that sample or that's able to be amplified with um, the primers that you're using. So you're gonna get a list of, of sequences. Um, it is, you get a lot of data with this method. You get a lot of data potentially about a lot of different species. So you can get data, data about entire communities, which is really exciting, um, but it is more labor intensive and it is um, more expensive to do this, this route, the meta barcoding route. If on the other hand, you're just interested in is species X present in this environment? Or is it present, you know, how much, how much DNA is present? Then you can do what's called qPCR, quantitative PCR. Um, that is, the, these assays are designed for single species and um, they're nice because they are both less expensive and they also um, give you a, uh, can give you a reliable quantity of the amount of DNA from your target species in the environment. Um, the downside is that you're just getting the one, the one species at a time. So if you're interested in more of a community-wide um, picture, then meta barcoding is the, the approach that you'd want to go for. Um, just to give you a little, so I'm not going to talk too much about qPCR in the rest of the talks, but I want to give you a little bit of an idea of how it works. Um, so basically you design a fluorescent probe for your species. And then what you're looking at is how the amount of your PCR ch product changes over time. Uh, and that increase should be inversely correlated to the initial amount of DNA template that you had in your uh, sample. And so again, single species assay, but can give you an idea of um, if that species is present and how much DNA from that species was present in your sample. So it can be really nice. Um, we've used it recently. Um, this is a paper by my CUNY student, Sam Chen, who looked at um, uh, American eel DNA in the um, Bronx River. And so we compared it to um, eel abundance as measured by electroshocking. So we, we paired it with an electroshocking survey. 
And what you can see in this figure on the right is there is a pretty good correlation between how much eDNA, eDNA we find at each site versus um, the abundance of eels as measured by, uh, by electroshocking. So um, that's just a little case study. Uh, and I'm happy to, to um, you can send Cynthia that paper as well if anyone wants to take a look at it. All right, and then so on to metabarcoding. Um, metabarcoding I mentioned is gonna get you a lot of species. So it'll tell you about, um, you know, potentially like all the species that have left their DNA behind in that environmental sample that you've taken. This is a cool example of a metabarcoding study that was done on the blood of leeches um, in Southeast Asia and was used to um, determine the diversity of mammals <laughs> that these leeches were feeding on by looking at what DNA was present in, um, in the blood meal. So there's a lot of different uh, applications. Uh, to understand metabarcoding, it helps to remind ourselves what traditional DNA barcoding is all about. So um, you, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this notion of DNA barcoding, right? So we're using a, a, a short standardized gene region. Um, usually in vertebrates, it's cytochrome oxidase 1 or CO1 is the typical uh, barcoding marker. So that means um, the, the little sort of piece of the genome of interest. And we match that. Uh, so we sequence that from an unknown sample. Uh, in the case of DNA barcoding, usually we're talking about a tissue sample or some, you know, some physical sample, uh, not an environmental sample. That's a mixture. Um, so we, we sequence that unknown sample and then we match it against a reference database. And um, that reference database is pretty key. So the reference database has to be, you know, has to have your sequence, your species of interest in order to be able to match it, right? So that's, you know, one, um, one area where we know a lot of, a lot more attention is needed is to try to build up reference databases for, um, for these, you know, for, for the diversity of life. Uh, but this, this beautiful diagram here that was created by uh, Mark Stokel gives a, a nice uh, indication of how these, these barcodes work. So basically here, each different color represents a different um, base pair. And we're looking at how uh, our unknown sequence matches um, a reference sequence. Um, the overall process for, you know, to going from sample all the way to our biodiversity data for metabarcoding is, you know, we start out with, so let's say, a water sample filter that, get our DNA. Um, we can then amplify our barcoding marker. You can also do whole genome shotgun sequencing. Um, that's a bit, uh, bit pricier. Um, we do our, our, our sequencing of the amplified marker and then a whole, a whole mess of, um, of uh, bioinformatic uh, pipelines to clean the sequences and then assign taxonomy. In other words, take those sequences that we get back and assign um, a species to each one as, as feasible, given, given that it is, uh, we are reliant on those, on those reference databases. From there, we can build phylogenetic trees and then do a whole lot of other cool stuff that I'll, that I'll talk about. Um, so the reason that eDNA is having its moment now, and, and, and the, despite the fact that PCR has been around for you know, decades and decades, is um, because of the, the, um, the rise of cheaper next generation sequencing, which allows us to, um, to essentially sequence mixtures of DNA um, much more cheaply on a, on, a, on a per sample basis than we have been able to do before now. So um, all the technologies that we will talk about uh, with metabarcoding, they were all possible several decades ago, but it's only now that they've be that the price has dropped. Um, this is, you can see cost per rob megabase of DNA sequence. This is quite out of date. It's continued to fall um, faster than Moore's law. It's interesting. So it's, you know, the, the reason that eDNA is suddenly, you know, feasible on a wide scale is because of um, next generation sequencing and the fact that it's gotten cheap enough for even um, ecologists to use. <laughs> All right, so um, I've mentioned a few of the strengths of eDNA already um, in contrast to some of the traditional sampling methods. One of them is the ease of sampling, right? So you don't need any special expertise. You can literally go out with a Nalgene bottle, with a bottle, an empty bottle, collect water, um, in order to do the sampling. 
You can also, once that DNA um, from the water is filtered um, and once it's extracted, then you can save that DNA extraction. Uh, it should contain um, you know, the, the sum total of all the DNA in that environmental sample. So even if you're analyzing it at first for fishes, if you, you know, 10 years later want to go back to that sample, um, let's say the technology is improved and you're able to, to do, you know, to improve on your past sampling, or let's say you have a collaboration, you want to look at snail diversity now, um, you can go back to that sample. So it, those collections really represent a long-term snapshot of diversity, which I find um, really compelling. Um, I mentioned you can you can uh, identify cryptic species, invasive species. You can identify different life stages, right? DNA is DNA; it doesn't change across life stages. Um, you can look for migration and spawning behaviors uh, much more easily than um, might be possible with those traditional sampling methods. And as I mentioned, you can also get a community snapshot. So you can identify species from many different taxonomic groups. So if you wanted to do, you know, like we've looked at both fish diversity and microbial diversity from the same samples, um, which is a really neat aspect of it. Uh, if we look at how eDNA com compares to other survey methods, this is an older paper now, but the, the results are, you know, have, have held up across other studies. Um, we find that eDNA gets us comparable and usually slightly higher number of species return that we can identify from a sample um, compared to other traditional means um, for sampling. Here it's uh, fish again. All I, right, so, yes, please, question? please go for it. Is there any way that we know of to identify um, different life stages of certain organisms? using eDNA sampling? No, sadly, the only thing that comes close is telomere length. Mm, okay. So, um, you, you know, tel telomeres are used for aging um, and there's, there's, there's some pretty good now becoming standardized approaches for that. But, um, but yeah, usually with eDNA, we're usually working with very fragmented pieces of genomes. And so, yeah, unfortunately, there's not really a way to do that aging from the eDNA. That's a good question. All right. So with that, what are a few of the weaknesses of the eDNA approach? Um, so one of the, the big ones is that um, you do have this issue with contamination because you're amplifying such a small signal, right? So you're, you're looking for, it's not a needle in the haystack exactly, but it's um, relatively low levels of DNA in a sample. And, um, and as I was just mentioning, it tends to be degraded also, right? Get DNA gets broken down relatively quickly in environments. And so uh, you always have to be vigilant about contamination from other sources, right? And that contamination can come in a couple of different ways. It could be contamination from somewhere else in your lab. Um, for example, it's typical, you know, we're using, um, we're using a method that is designed to um, amplify all, all vertebrates. So it's typical that we have like around 50% of our sequences we get back will be human. <laughs> sometimes dogs, sometimes cat, you know, right? We get, we get all that kind of contamination. Uh, and then we also get contamination in the sense that we might get, um, you know, DNA that's a real signal from the environment, but that we're not necessarily, uh, that's not necessarily in line with what we're, the question that we're after. Um, for example, we've sampled in New York nearby fish markets, and um, we pick up all these um, species from fish markets that are um, not the native fish species that we're looking for in the stream, but they're clearly coming from wastewater. Uh, we have a lot of different variables that affect um, how much DNA organisms shed into the environment and how that DNA gets preserved. And we don't have a great handle on that yet. So that, that really comes into play when we're thinking about how we interpret the amount of DNA from a particular species that we're getting. Uh, in terms of the data that we get, there's not really a single agreed upon pipeline yet. And that's something the eDNA community, I think everybody wants that. Uh, and we're, we're kind of starting to move towards it, um, but it's, it's not there yet. The sample collection is easy. That's the good news. The sample processing and data collection can be a bit more challenging. And I'll run through what that looks like and what some of the options are for, um, for teachers in a classroom. 
Uh, and then, yeah, as I just kind of alluded to, um, we can, it's, it's very straightforward to say, yes, a species is there in this environment. Um, it is less straightforward to say how many of those species are there in the environment from that sample, particularly with the metabar coding approach, inferring abundance um, has a lot of pitfalls and um, needs a lot of ground truthing in order to really make, be able to make those inferences. And then as I keep kind of hammering on, um, those accurate identifications are only as good as your reference database. And we'll see that with the activity at the end. Um, this is a question that always comes up uh, no matter what audience you're talking with about eDNA and your students will wonder too, how long does it stick around in the water? So um, it, there's been a number of studies on this uh, question now. It is environment specific, but it does not seem to be um, months, right? We know that it's on, usually on the order of hours to days, sometimes weeks. Um, the weak spit would only be if you've got very stagnant water. Um, if you have flowing water, then obviously your DNA is both being degraded and it's also getting carried away. So you have to kind of think about that as well. Um, but in general, we, um, you know, we, we, in our, in our studies, uh, we find that there's a good correlation between the animals that are there, um, in, again, on that order of hours to days and the eDNA signals that we get. So that's just kind of a ballpark way to think about it. Um, like I said, there's a lot of um, factors that will affect that. So hotter temperatures, hotter water temperatures, we call that cause that eDNA to degrade faster. Uh, eDNA also sticks to sediment; it, it adheres to sediment, and so usually, a, usually, if you have a sediment sample, it will have kind of a longer signal of the eDNA in there than the the water. The water, the eDNA in the water, turns over very quickly, and the sediment a bit less so. Um, the one other complication is that it looks like degradation rates can, can be species specific in, in addition to environment specific. We're still not sure why this might be. It might have to do with what kind of cells are being sloughed into the environment for different species. Um, but this is a, a study I'd refer you to if you're, if you want to know more about, um, uh, about that. So here they're looking at the difference in, uh, DNA degradation over a short time period between stickleback and a flatfish. All right, so moving quickly into the um, overview of the, the process of collecting and analyzing DNA. So this is um, a student of mine, Jessica Miranda, you can see her in the Bronx River collecting a water sample. Um, this is like a kind of a little on the right, this is our lab set up from the Florida Keys. Um, outside a, a motel room. <laughs> you can see the bleach here, got an extensive bleach collections to make sure that we're not cross-contaminating samples. Um, but it is a pretty portable technique, which is nice. All right, so I mentioned first, we have to filter the water samples to, in order to um, get, uh, get, get the DNA out of the water. And then we've got to get um, the DNA off that filter. So this is one way that we can do it. So these, these are other students sampling, um, sampling water here. Um, this is a one kind of setup that you can use for, um, for filtering the water. So this little uh, white disc here on the right is the filter, that's the fiber filter. And um, it's yellow because we've already passed the water through and those are um, likely um, phytoplankton that are uh, causing the filter to, to be a different color. Uh, next, we would, so this is just kind of an overview, amplify, um, in other words, do PCR on a, a segment of mitochondrial DNA. So um, a commonly used one for fish, and it's what we use in our lab, is the 12S gene. Um, there's, you might ask if CO1 is the barcoding gene, why aren't we using that? Uh, and the quick answer is that um, we can, but it kind of narrows the scope of fish that we can identify because um, of the fact that um, the length of sequence that we can successfully amplify with 12S and still get a pretty broad range of fish is shorter, which is more um, sort of a better fit for the degraded DNA samples we usually get from eDNA. Uh, we do some PCR replicates, combine those replicates and sequence um, those um, amplifications on a next generation sequencing platform. And then we 
do all the bioinformatics to match those sequences to our reference database, uh, which is the NCBI uh, GenBank database that you'll be getting a little experience with later. Um, when you're thinking about sampling in the field, so if you're taking your students into the field, there's a few considerations. Uh, a big one is when. So obviously it's, you know, in, in, on the East Coast, it can be tricky to try to find a time to avoid big rain events. That's especially important when it comes to eDNA. You know, a big rain event is just gonna really change the signal of DNA that you're getting from that water body. Uh, if, it's, if you're searching in a river, then you're gonna get scouring and flooding. Um, if it's a, a lake, then you're just going to get kind of a dilution effect, right? You could also get sediment being stirred up. So it's best to avoid extreme weather, um, both for the purposes of, of keeping everybody happy during the sampling and then also for the, the data signal itself. Uh, if you're working in marine environments, obviously tidal cycles are something you'll want to pay attention to as well. Um, how many samples and what volume of samples is the next question that people often ask. Um, and this, you know, really depends on kind of your capacity. But um, the good news is that uh, even a relatively small sample is going to get you a pretty good estimation of diversity in, in, that, um, in that region. So, um, you know, a one liter sample um, is we've found in, in our kind of our, our um, back of the envelope cap calculations, gets you most of the way to a, a, um, the same kind of species list that you would get if you sampled three or five liters of water. Um, one liter is nice because usually one liter, we can filter using just one, fil one of those glass fiber filters. Um, more than one liter tends to be with the water samples we're working in harder to harder to get um, through through a single filter. And so then you're just talking about a lot more processing. Uh, so that's our, our typical amount. Um, water can be collected at the surface. It can be collected at depth um, near the benthos. So at the bottom um, surface, it seems to work just fine. Um, you get a pretty, again, integrated signal. Um, there's been a few studies now too, looking at the difference between surface and in the water column. And you, you know, if it's a very deep system, then obviously you're gonna get some differences uh, before the, the kind of water bodies that, that we're working in, um, surface samples are, are, are work well, which is nice because that means that you don't, uh, you don't need any fancy sampling equipment to be trying to take really deep samples. Um, soil samples, uh, typically you wanna scrape off the surface and take a little bit of a core so get a few uh, centimeters deep in order to take that sediment sample. Um, for sample preservation, um, we have filtered on site, so you can filter water samples on site and preserve those filters in the field um, using ethanol or silica or DNA extraction buffer. Um, you can also, I mean, if you're if you're uh, if you've got liquid nitrogen, then that's that's the gold standard, but um, not practical most of the time to be carrying around a doer of liquid nitrogen. Um, we've recently. Um, discovered that you, there, there are a few companies that are making self-preserving um, filters like Smith Root that are stable for months at room temperature. And that's really terrific because uh, then you can ship them. You can, you know, once, once that water is filtered, it's easy to move the filters around. The filters are very light um, carrying, you know, as you can see here from our collection of bottles, carrying like 30 bottles of water around is less, less practical. So um, if anybody's interested in those self-preserving filters, uh, definitely check them out. They work with hand pumps. Um, they're great. And the Smith Root has been, a, um, I've, I've found them to be a really wonderful um, company to work with. Okay, and then just real briefly, uh, once you've got that, um, that, those filters, the extraction method is similar to what it is for tissue um, with a few little twists. But basically, in all cases, uh, you are, whether you're using a kit or something, um, sort of a cheaper set of reagents, you need an alkaline lysis step. Um, you either are going to uh, absorb uh, DNA or centrifuge it out in a high salt buffer, and then finally elute your purified DNA in um, water or buffer. Um, so, you know, I, I said, oops, sorry. I suggest if you're, if you're, if you're new to, um, to DNA extractions, um, 
the kits can be really good. The trick with the kits is that they do, most of them do require a centrifuge. Um, so a micro centrifuge. So if that's something that you have access to in your, um, in your lab, or you can partner up with a nearby lab to, um, to do that, then that's a, that's a, a it's great to be able to use those kits because they're they're you know they're real step by step and easy for students to follow. Um, one important point here is that so once you get the purified DNA extracted, it's super stable. You can freeze it at minus eighty or even minus twenty for years, decades. Um, but the more you thaw and refreeze it, uh, it does degrade over time. All right, and I'm not going to spend too much time on the overview of the data analysis, but just to, to kind of give you a sense of what this looks like. You start out with uh, raw sequences, depending on what method you use, you could have anywhere from, you know, 50 to 5 million sequences per sample. So it's a lot of data potentially. Um, but that's great because that means that you have the chance to pick up not just the really common species in your sample, but even the rare stuff. Um, so after you clean it up, and that's what this whole first row is about, then the real, um, the real challenge comes in the taxonomic identification. And so, again, you're going to be getting a little tiny bit of practice with that uh, in our exercise at the end. Uh, and then once you have those taxonomic tables, you can do all kinds of fun things like looking at differential abundance, looking at heat maps, um, all kinds of different diversity analyses. And I'll show you some examples of those in a little bit. Um, and yes, thank you, Liz, for defining benthos. Um, so you're going to see something like this when you're doing your, uh, your exercise. So after you've done your sequencing and your data quality filtering, um, then you'll, the, the, there are pipelines that will match all your sequences to the reference database. Today, we're going to be doing it by hand for just a very small number. But I just wanted to give you um, an idea of what these sequences that you get back would look like. Right? So um, this is what they would look like, just a, a short, in you know, a relatively short chunk of the genome that's in the same piece has been amplified um, for, uh, for DNA from all the species in your sample. Uh, and then when you do that matching against the reference database, you're gonna be looking for a couple of important numbers. Um, the first one to check out is called the identity, and that means how many how many of the base pairs in your um, in your sequence matched against the a, a, a sequence that's already in the reference database. So here you have a hundred percent match, and you can see that all these little vertical lines are present. If there was a mismatch, then the vertical line would not be present. Um, so that's the, this is the, the the most important kind of. Um, piece of information that you'll be looking for when you do your, your exercise. Um, now, I mentioned a lot of species might not be in the reference database. And so this is always kind of a point of confusion for students because they'll just say like, you know, they, 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 the kind of the impulse is to say, oh, here's the first match that comes up must be what species it is. So it's important to kind of get across to, um, to students that, uh, uh, that, you know, just because there is a match doesn't mean that is the species that this DNA, your DNA came from, right? That um, many times the match is not, not perfect. And what might look pretty good to us, like a 95% match is actually probably not the same species. So there's no hard cutoff, but the rule of thumb for vertebrates is, you know, you want something in the range of two or 3% um, uh, identity. And beyond that, it's likely to be a different species. Again, that's just like real, real rough rule, right? Um, but the key, the key thing to get across is that it's entirely possible, and depending on the group you're working on, maybe even likely that the exact species that you have in your sample is not present in the reference database. So in that case, you're learning about what genus it's from, or sometimes just what family it's from, right? So you can make those kinds of inferences, but not necessarily to species level. Uh, here, OTU stands for Operational Taxonomic Unit. That's sort of a stand-in for, you can think of that like a species um, in a way. So it's sort of a stand-in for a, um, sort of finer scale taxonomic level. 
So your final data set then, what you're going for in the end looks like this, where you've got your, um, your sequences. So you've got all your sequences, and then you've got a taxonomic assignment for each one. So this is for bacteria, um, and it's giving you, depending on how well that the, the reference database um, represent, re represented each particular sequence, uh, you may have it all the way out to strain for bacteria. You know, in the case of species, it might be like um, subspecies, uh, but often it's going to be something like, you know, not very satisfying. Um, and that, again, is, it just depends on the group you're working on and how well represented it is in the reference database. And then um, for each sample, you'll have some, um, some indication of the frequency of that particular sequence in your sample. All right, so what can you do once you get to that stage? Well, um, you, can, you can ask what species are present at each site and how do they compare across sites? So just the very, that very first step is generally really exciting for students. Like just to sort of find out like, you know, because it does have a little bit of a, like a CSI aspect to it. Um, you're starting with a water sample, right? <laughs> it looks like clear water. And then uh, when you get that first taxonomic list back, it's super exciting to see what, you know, what, what DNA is in that water. Um, so you can, you know, just, just that, that sort of presence of different species is exciting to begin with. And then you can start asking um, some additional questions, like how does the overall diversity vary across sites? You can, you can explore different diversity indices if that's something you've covered in your, um, in your class. Uh, you can do a sampling curve. So how many more species do you detect with each additional sample? So do kind of a rarefaction analysis and even young kids, very young kids can do this just with a simple graph. Um, how does the composition of the community um, change across sites? So not just what species are there, but um, the, the relative abundance of each species. And you can look for particular species too as well. So you may be interested in a non-native or a pathogenic species, and those can be really interesting to, to look for. This is an example of data. I'll show you a few example of data plots um, from, um, this is from a study that was done on different environments around a hospital. So you, here you can see this, each, each of these bar graphs represents a different sample that was taken. So this first one was at the nurse station countertop. So somebody came along, swabbed this, amplified it, sequenced it, and did all that downstream analysis we just saw. And now here's the bar graph comparing um, the microbial communities across these different, um, different environments. Uh, so this is the kind of cool graphic that you can use to kind of get a real a uh, quick visual sense of, of how these environments compare. Um, here's an example of what the rarefaction curves um, could look like for same data set. So as you, um, as you go up in sequences per sample, so as you increase your sequencing, how many more um, observed species do you get? Um, this is a principal coordinate analysis. So uh, I'd say for high school and college students, this would be a great, um, great type of analysis to pursue because again, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty intuitive visual you know, plot of similarity between uh, these, these different communities. So here you can see that samples um, that cluster together in space are those that, are, that have more similar communities biological communities, in this case, microbes. So here we see that uh, operating room floor, tabletops, lobby wood, and carpet floors. So all these floors are, are pretty similar to each other in terms of um, the microbes that are there, but very different from say, toilet bowls, which is good. <laughs> all right, um, here's a couple tools for analysis that I uh, encourage you to check out. This is always a bit of a work in progress because the tools change so quickly. And how user friendly they are varies a lot between tools. So these are just a couple that I have found are accessible for um, for high school students, um, especially those that are a bit more advanced, and um, for undergrads as well, starting with uh, with freshmen. So DNA Subway is a great one. This is a, a um, made by our friends at Cold Spring Harbor and uh, really nice and user friendly. Uh, it implements Chime too. So if your students are a bit more advanced and willing to, to um, explore a command line, <laughs> uh, Chime 2 is, is also great and comes with a lot of tutorials. 
Um, and then if they're get, so you can use Excel for all those, you know, for a lot of those plots I just showed, um, but our, and uh, our studio will take you to the next level of data analysis and figure production. So you can use a package called Vegan um, that's great for diversity analyses and that can be used to, to estimate um, diversity indices to, to make those rarefaction curves like I just showed, the, um, the principal components analysis and, and lots and lots more. All right, so let's just say a few things here about ways that you can incorporate eDNA into the classroom. These are some of my undergrads working away on a DNA extraction from sediment. Uh, all right, so what can students do? This eDNA clearly can get really technical. And so a big focus of this project has been to, to think about what aspects of this students can do in a hands-on way, what could be outsourced, and then what aspects might we be able to kind of model in the classroom, even if we're not doing the actual molecular work. So um, first thing is that um, students love obviously to be in the field. You, you all know that because you're here. Um, so any kind of field sampling that you can do is fantastic. Um, these little um, syringe filters are terrific. So they don't filter as much water as, uh, as we do with this contraption on the right. Um, but they, but they're super accessible, and you will get a you will get a DNA signal out of them. So they're very very easy to use and um, and inexpensive. So those are a great um, great item for uh, for this kind of project. Um, if you want to do the DNA extraction yourself, again that just you know centrifuge is sort of the big ticket item that a lab. Um, generally needs to have. There are some methods that do not use centrifuges, however. So if anyone's interested in those, um, let me know and I can, I can try to point you in the right direction. Uh, otherwise, it is possible to, um, to send these filters to a lab to have them analyzed. And I can talk about that in a second. Um, extraction and PCR equipment is some, something that some high schools uh, do have. Um, and so in that case, you can always do a single species PCR to detect presence absence. If you've got a thermocycler, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and so I'll mention two other things. First of all, um, collaborating with a nearby lab um, like Cold Spring Harbor. So Cold Spring Harbor has, as you probably many of you know, an amazing education program. And um, they are, uh, they're really great for helping out high school classrooms in, in um, these kinds of technologies. Um, there's also this option. So this is one that with Kenneth's help, um, we've been exploring. Um, so this is a private company that makes a um, relatively inexpensive kit. So you wouldn't want to buy one of these for every student, obviously, but you could get one, you know, one for the classroom. And um, the idea is that they send you everything you need to do the sampling in this kit. And then with a little self-enclosed envelope, you mail them the filter and then they mail you back the data. So every, that's all for the $89. $89 includes the sequencing, the PCR, the sequencing, that whole process that I just talked about. The downside, it's one sample, right? But as, as you saw, you can get a lot of data potentially from one sample. Um, and obviously, if you had the resources, you could kind of ramp that up. So if you had a couple hundred dollar grant, you could do a couple different sites and compare across them, which could be, which could be cool too. Um, so, so far so good. We've, we've, um, tried to road test this a little bit and, um, we're awaiting the results, but we'll keep you, keep you posted. Um, the other thing that we're working on is trying to develop some low tech eDNA exercises for the classroom that would not involve any material besides just paper and pencil and some pictures. So, um, this is this is sort of the, the the beginning of an exercise that we're working up for that could be potentially used in you know it may be as young as fifth grade classrooms and you could kind of build up the complexity um, through college if you wanted. Um, so the idea here is that you would um, pretend to have a body of water in your classroom. So you you know this could be like if you have like an area rug or um, a lab whatever it is, uh, pretend like that's the body of water. It's ideal, I think, if you can use throughout this example, if you could use a, um, a real, you know, a local 
water body. So something, you know, something that's nearby, a local environmental problem, local species. So really, you know, kind of make this specific for your, your area, your region. And then um, throughout that environment, you're going to, the, the teacher will put paper DNA sequences. So look, so this little diagram on the bottom left here is designed to, to show what that would look like. So maybe this is like an area of your rug that you've like mapped off as being the lake. Um, so you're going to put little strips of paper with these brief DNA, you know, very short DNA sequences on them that represent the fish DNA barcodes. And then you have students sample the eDNA by um, randomly picking out their barcodes. Okay. And so here you could, you know, you could also show them the filters. You could explain um, the process of filtration. You could even have um, some filters there to show it to them. Um, and then depending on the level of the students, they could either then talk about amplification, the PCR process and sequencing process, or you could just kind of skip straight to the reference database matching. So um, in another section of the classroom, you'd have a whole bunch of, uh, let's say you're doing fish, you could have a whole bunch of pictures of the spe you know, each species of fish with the barcode on it. And then students would just be simply matching up these environmental DNA sequences with the ref, their, their reference fishes, right? Um, so from, from that, you can have students make that taxonomic table by hand, right? Um, it'll be a small one, um, but that's fine. They can even do a very simple rarefaction curve, right? A simple chart of how many species they're recovering if they pick up one DNA barcode strip, two DNA barcode, et cetera. So as you increase the number of samples, how do you increase the number of species that you're retrieving? So um, that, you know, that gets into uh, skills like quantitative reasoning and graphing that could be very, um, could be very helpful. And then, as I mentioned, for upper middle school students or high school students or college students, then you can really dive into some deeper lessons on PCR, on complementarity of bases, uh, and then on diversity patterns. Um, so some examples of those kinds of diversity patterns, and I just showed a few with the hospital um, surfaces example, but um, you could take this into a data analysis exercise and, um, and do it either in Excel or R. Um, so you could have students uh, perform basic statistics on their diversity data, quantify diversity matrices like Shannon and Simpson indices, um, create these nice stacked bar, uh, bar plots, very easy in, in uh, Excel. And then, um, as I mentioned, the PCA, the principal components analysis for those students that wanna take it to uh, one step further uh, using the vegan package in R. And I've had freshmen college students do this um, and they're, they're able to kind of walk through all those pieces of the, da the data analysis, even for those who had never seen Excel or R before. All right, so that is what I wanted to cover for this first bit. And let me, I, I wanna make sure we get just a few minutes to stretch. Um, so if you don't mind, let's come back in three minutes. I'll stick around in case there's any questions. We'll come back at 2.35 and we'll dive into this hands-on activity. So I'll, I'll stick around for questions in the meantime.
All right. So, sorry, that was a very quick break. Let's see, I think we've got most people back now. Okay, so um, before I dive into this, um, just want to see if there's any general comments or questions that folks have about um, any of what I just covered. It was a bit of a fire hose, um, but uh, hopefully you can start to think about potential applications for your own classrooms. Okay, so um, without any further ado then, let's dive with the last kind of half hour we have here, let's dive into this hands-on activity. So um, I think easiest is gonna be to pair folks up. Um, so I'll put you in a couple different, or I don't think I can put you in breakout groups, but Cynthia, maybe you're able, I'm thinking three people per group. And then you should sure. all have the, um, so I'm gonna stop sharing this. You should all have the documents that Cynthia sent. I think, right? They're in the, yeah, yes, they you've got the be... link to the Google Drive. Yes, it's the so link to So you're gonna to start, drive. yep. You're gonna start with the one that says BOP eDNA data exercise. So open up, you can go ahead and open up that. And then you're going to be using the example data. Great, thank you. Um, and let me just answer Katie's email real quick. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, there, there's a few organizations around New York that are starting to use eDNA um, and all kinds of other things for um, community science projects. One that comes to mind is Hudson River. Um, uh, Cynthia, help me out here. It's Hudson River Park. Hudson River Foundation. Park Trust. Park Trust. <laughs> <laughs> Hudson River Park Trust. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know that they've, they've been working on um, getting you know, water sampling and eDNA um, and then um, the River Project, of course, yep. is the other big one. Uh, other recommendations from the group that the folks that have worked with community science organizations? Sorry, on a different note, I have the breakout rooms set up, so I'm going to open all the rooms if anyone wants to keep thinking about um, other organizations. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And I think Galen, I put you in a room too. <laughs> good, good. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Sorry, I'm muted. I apologize. I do have to run because of oh, okay. the kids and dinner, but I just wanted to thank you so much. This is yeah, really nice. awesome. We'll definitely keep in touch if you um, yeah, if there's any anything I can do to help. Absolutely will. Thanks again. Take care. Bye. <laughs> I mean, in that case, um, there's one room with just two people. Uh, so there's room one has three people, room two has two people, and then room three has two educators. So I can start putting them in. I can just move people around. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not too important. I think as long as everybody okay. has somebody. Someone else. Okay. To talk to. Yeah. Sure. And are you able to just pop around and join the different That I don't. Or do I... Usually I, let me see if. I don't think I know because I'm not a host. Maybe if you make me co-host, I might be able to. Okay. Let's see. More make a co-host. Yes. Okay. Oh, can yes. You now see I about can, that yes. Now, now okay. I can see the breakout rooms. Great. Sorry about that. No problem. All right. Okay, I'm going to give them a, a minute to kind of read through stuff before. Oh, I... sure. 
Um, and I can pause the recording for this.